Hey everybody, and welcome to another season here on Hale State Debate, the greatest uh, debate YouTube channel <laughs> in the greater Starkville metropolitan area. That's right. Uh, we're here for the very first PF topic of the year. Uh, and it's a doozy resolve. The United States federal government should substantially increase its military presence in the Arctic. We will get to some thoughts on that in just one second. But first, a few quick announcements as usual. Uh, as always, we want this video to be useful to you, as always on our channel. So uh, the sources we cite, as, long, as well as the timestamps and the links to our social media, will be in the description below. If it's useful to you, uh, maybe like, maybe subscribe, uh, maybe tell a friend. And with that, because we have a huge topic to cover, let's jump right in and do some initial thoughts. Shall I go first? Sure. Yes. Let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna be real honest with you. I do not love this topic. Uh, <laughs> the, the NSDA PF committee seems to have decided that every year we're gonna like start the year with these massive, broad, like geostrategic topics. And number one, it's like our de facto novice topic for PF. All of our new people, eighth graders and ninth graders are doing this. And it's just really hard for them and for anybody, I think, to connect these like long link chains from like a specific policy decision about the military all the way to to these vague like grand strategy questions mm -hmm. involving multiple countries that frankly not even experts can really get their hands fully around uh, and, and there's just so many variables we're talking about things like who are the players what is the geography what is the legal framework what does the status quo look like you know what are the relevant countries saying about their future plans and all those things but it's the topic we've got right so and because it is a topic that is so broad there are two things that i think are important and one is extensive reading and the other is storytelling mm -hmm. right extensive reading because like we just said, uh, there are so many different variables, right? Mm -hmm. Resources, trade routes, indigenous peoples, climate change, mm -hmm. Ukraine, China, colonialism. You're going to have to be able to recall facts about all these things and like juxtapose them next to each other in real time. There's like literally no way you can write a block for every possible combination of these things and how they weigh against each other. So if you don't know stuff right beyond your case, mm -hmm. if you haven't read up on it, uh, you're going to be in a bad way. So you just have to read and you have to put in the work and kind of drink from a fire hose there. Mm -hmm. Story Storytelling is important because your judge is not going to do that, right? Your judge is not debating on this topic, and they're probably not going to know a whole heck of a lot about uh, military Arctic issues because I certainly didn't when mm -hmm. I started researching this. You know, there are some topics where they might be able to intuitively understand links, but this is not one of them. So the bottom line is the teams, I think, that spend time mastering the subject matter and getting so good at it that can actually tell stories about it are going to have a huge advantage on this topic. Right. So I know that's a tall order, but I think that's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Devin? Yeah, I, I agree with Brett. Um, you know, this is, this is a huge can of worms. And I mean, the silver lining here is that this is a somewhat interesting topic. Yeah. It's just, how are you going to fit all of the subject matter uh, in the 700 words? And, and like Brett said, you know, PF debaters are going to have to do something that they're not very comfortable with, is, which is talking to people uh, like they're real people and, you know, being persuasive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, you know, uh, it's a good way to learn a new skill, even though this is not what NSDA wanted, they're just phoning this one in. Right, it's, mm -hmm. a, bad, it's, a, it's a good way to learn a new skill. It's not an ideal time right. to learn an entirely right. new skill set right. at the beginning of the year. So, mm -hmm. Tanner? Yeah, so what I believe is it's really one word that makes this resolution not as lopsided as it would be, uh, and it's substantially. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're on the pro or the con, the word substantially is going to be critical to this debate. And we're going to get into that when it comes to definitions and framing, but like this one word is really going to decide if the judge marks its ballot, AF or, or pro in this case, pro or con. And it really is going to be on the basis of that, on how you are persuasive in that matter. That's really going to come uh, to your ballot. And like Brett said, you know, we're talking about economics, we're talking about national security, resource extraction, preventing illegal activity, all these things. There are so many things that are being considered, and you have to make it digestible. You just have to, because you only have a very little bit amount of time to get your judge to do something that you really want, which is to mark that ballot on your side. Mm -hmm. So go very simple, make it digestible, and make it very easy. Use that storytelling ability. Okay, so those are the initial thoughts. We will do what we always do on this channel, which is kind of go in order. We will start with some factual background. Frankly, there's a lot. Um, a lot of the value of this video, I think, is going to be in the factual background section. Then we'll do a few definitions, then the pro arguments, then the con arguments, and then come back with some final thoughts. Okay, so let's get things cracking with um, some factual background uh, on the topic. This is going to take a minute, but I think it's worth it. We start with the most obvious question, which is, why does the Arctic matter? So Tanner, why does the Arctic matter? Well, it's very, very simple. Briefly, the Arctic is really seen to be pretty much a major global power as the next frontier for two key reasons. One is the resources, and two, it's the shipping. 
So we can see with the resources because there is a widespread belief that the Arctic contains massive reservoirs of oil and natural gas, as well as other resources like rare earth minerals. And that kind of rush to the final frontier is going to be big. Um, and additionally, as climate change leads to melting of Arctic sea ice, new, considerably shorter sh uh, shipping routes open up, which leaves the potential to reduce both time and cost of shipping goods, giving whoever has access to them. So people are trying to rush up there uh, to get these resources and to get uh, a good shipping route that saves them money and time in the long run. Uh, according to NASA, uh, on there in 2022, it says the Arctic winter sea ice uh, is the 10th lowest on record. So yeah, you, can you can sort of see this yeah. trough here, right? Yeah. In other words, it's not the lowest ever, but you can see a long-term trend of like there's just less and less sea ice, right? Right, and that's going to result in better shipping patterns for people that want to save money or save time. So people are really rushing up there because they're seeing this as an opportunity to get resources or get better shipping. So we don't know exactly how the battle for these resources will play out, but what we do know is that players like the U.S., Russia, and Canada are currently making conflicting claims to greater territory in the Arctic, setting the stage for what could potentially be a major conflict over resources. So really the bottom line is that the Arctic is, if you'll forget the pun, the hot new place to be if you're a major global power or want to be one. So what we can see is that there are major resources, there are major wants in the Arctic, and this is why big players want to be a part of it. Right, uh, and those, those major players um, are not a whole lot of people, honestly, uh, but there's certainly a, a, a really eclectic list of, of countries involved here. Um, for one, the United States is involved, obviously, right, we're, we're sort of writing about that, that's what we're debating about. Um, the United States claims territorial rights in the Arctic by virtue of Alaska and also by virtue of being a globe-spanning superpower uh, that just kind of does what it wants, even though obviously in the Arctic, um, we don't have the capabilities to do whatever we want. That's just sort of our, you know, that's sort of our feng shui for the most part. Uh, <laughs> we don't have the icebreakers or anything like that that Russia does. But speaking of Russia, they're also uh, one of the major players. Uh, not surprising as Russia owns 53% of the coastline in the Arctic Circle and half of the population of the Arctic. All five people that live in the Arctic, <laughs> half of them are Russian. Uh, come on, <laughs> come on. Um, when I said eclectic earlier, what I was referring to is China, which is a bit more uh, curious, uh, since they're nowhere near the Arctic whatsoever, even though they consider themselves a, what is it, a near Arctic a near state? Near Arctic state, quasi Arctic state. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sort of a near Canadian yeah, citizen. Right. You know? We can just say whatever we want. Now. <laughs> I live right next door. You know? <laughs> right. So, th those words just somehow carry meaning. Um, but they're heavily investing in Russian oil and gas development in the region since they badly need those resources and they also consider the Arctic important to their ongoing Belt and Road transportation slash infrastructure slash, you know, trapping poor countries in debt and seizing their assets scheme. Uh, <laughs> that, that's sort of integral to their whole plan, really. The, uh, you know, the Acme book of giving out loans. Yeah. Um, and then seizing like airports and dams <laughs> mm -hmm. when you can't pay for them, right? I, I don't know what they'll seize in this place. I guess they'll just take all the ice that will be gone. Well, and probably just take the oil. I mean, yeah, take right, the oil. Right, right? Uh -huh. so. um, Canada, obviously, again, they you know have forty percent. Uh, uh, forty percent of Canada's land mass is inside the Arctic Circle, uh, with about one hundred and fifty thousand residents, including many indigenous groups. And, and honestly, I think Canada is probably one of the most interesting things to talk about on the neg side because Canada and the United States have this huge ongoing, very minor, very obviously Canadian dispute going on between them and the United States about the Northwest Passage and who dominates that line. And again, that sort of goes back to our point about the U.S. just does what it wants. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Denmark and Greenland, of course, are also there. The Kingdom of Denmark includes both Greenland because Donald Trump was unable to purchase it. We were so close. Oh, right. He was <laughs> oh. almost there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get him next time. Uh, and, and the Faroe Islands with a total population of about 100,000 people, which is honestly pretty surprising. We're probably not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about Denmark and Greenland. Or the Faroe Islands. Yeah, yeah. but they're there. They're yeah. there. They yeah. certainly yeah. are. And they're all a part of NATO, which is another point right. to make. I mean, seven out of, well, I guess I can't say seven out of eight, Seven out of the eight actual countries that are actually in the Arctic are a part of NATO. Yeah. Um, in addition to these, not, to these nation states, there are also many indigenous people groups organized right. into various councils, associations, and tribal entities. And as usual, a major concern is that their rights and interests will be absolutely trampled as big, rich countries scramble for territory and resources. And we already see a lot of that happening uh, right now. 
Uh, and if you're looking for a quick, solid summary of all the Arctic nations and people groups, a great resource is the Arctic Council, which is a non-governmental entity formed in 1996, of which all these states and many indigenous groups are members. Mm -hmm. um, it has basically ceased functioning as a working diplomatic body since Russia stopped attending meetings uh, after the start of the Ukraine war, and of course our shunning of them after yeah. the Ukraine war, mm -hmm. but it remains a good source of information even if not consistently updated, and we will, of course, link to their website. Okay, so the next question, and I'm gonna answer it because I'm the lawyer on the team, <laughs> uh, is what is the legal slash territorial status of the Arctic? So first, let's be clear on what the Arctic is. When we say the Arctic, we're talking about the Arctic Circle, generally speaking. It is a literal circle around the top of the world <laughs> at about 66 degrees latitude north of the equator, so mercifully, we're not gonna have to spend much time on that in definitions. As you can see here in this map, much of that region is water. It's the Arctic Ocean and the various coastal seas, like the Beaufort Sea and the Barents Sea, uh, with a significant but shrinking portion mm -hmm. of that water being covered by the Arctic ice pack. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, it's not a landmass like Antarctica. I, I'm sure we're gonna have some a team of, God bless them, but like eighth graders come in and talk <laughs> about like the continent of the Arctic or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's okay, we live, we learn. But it's, a it's basically a partially frozen ocean encircled by land owned by various states. So one key question is, how do we decide who owns that ocean? And here's where it's lucky that we have a lawyer. The answer is unclose. Uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And I wanna say, throwback here, Unclose was literally the very first video we ever did on this channel. And it keeps just, it keeps rearing it, its It's head. so <laughs> weird, It's right? stupid, ugly. It's head. an incredibly it narrow thing, but it keeps coming up in these videos. <laughs> the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is how we decide who owns these waters. So, UNCLOS governs navigation and resource extraction claims in oceans and seas. It was adopted in 1982 and has 168 signatories, including Canada, Denmark, and Russia, but not the United States, and we'll come back to that several times. There are, it has two important functions on this topic. First of all, UNCLOS defines the sort of undisputed economic territories that all Arctic nations have, like in their coastal seas and then a little bit beyond their coastal seas, but it also provides the international law mechanism, like the, the, the mode that they can assert claims to even greater territory, which we'll talk about in a second. So you need to understand, I know this is kind of dry, but this is, this is the level of detail that really good teams will have. There are two kinds of control that you can have under UNCLOS. One is what's called the Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, and that is 200 nautical miles out from your coast. Um, and the other is Territorial Waters, which is only 12 nautical miles out from your coast. So the EEZ is a loose control. In other words, it's the economic right to exploit the area. So only you can drill for oil in that area. Only you can mine the seabed in that area. Only you can fish, but anybody can go through the EEZ. You cannot exclude other countries from navigating the EEZ. Territorial waters, on the other hand, are your exclusive territory. You can exclude other vessels from coming within 12 nautical miles of your shore. So here on this map, we can see the respective EEZs of the various Arctic states. These are out 200 miles from their respective coasts. And of course, if, if there's less than 200 miles between them, there's a negotiated line between them. And these are the places where economic control is undisputed, but navigation is open to anyone. And it's really important to know this. If you get confused on it and a team understands it, they can really trip you up. As you can see, more than half of the total land and sea area in the Arctic Circle is basically spoken for, either as land holdings or as territorial waters or as EEZs. So a lot of it is clearly delineated in terms of who owns it already under international law. But outside of these EEZs are international waters with no exclusive rights or control. And that's the blue area in the middle of the map, which in reality is usually covered by ice, although again, as we said before, to a decreasing extent. And that is a big part of what we're talking about here. This blue, partly ice-covered area in the middle is not the entirety of the dispute in the Arctic, but it's a big part of what the countries are fighting for, who's going to end up exercising control over this area. So now we have to talk about, like, what are we actually competing for, and what are we doing to get these things. So the first thing is natural resources, as we talked about before. Right. Uh, we, the natural resources is rife in the Arctic. We have oil, we have natural gas, and people are making a rush to it, specifically the players that Devin mentioned. Right. So this includes the oil and gas reserves, but also many, many untapped minerals, ores, and so on. 
So here's a map uh, from the German magazine, Der Spiegel. Der Spiegel. Spiegel. Der yeah. Spiegel. Yeah, Der Spiegel. And I, I don't want, I don't have a date or a link, but it gives you an idea of the sheer scope and diversity of resources we're talking about in the Arctic. So for the record, I don't know that we are considering polar bears as a strategic resource right now, because like, are we just gonna like put armor on them and like combat each Tanner, other? Tanner, I will say, if we can train <laughs> polar bears to fight and arm them, like the right to arm bears, then they will be a major strategic player. In the Arctic, but as of right now, we haven't done that. I mean, so. look, like in the whatever, you know, we had armed elephants at one time, there might as go. well have there polar bears. So, but if, if they could be trained to fight, then that would be phenomenal. But as we can see at this map, it's, it's a great map to see the natural resources that are available. So, we should clarify that a lot of the numbers countries rely on regarding oil and gas in the Arctic are unconfirmed. Right. We frequently hear numbers like 90 billion bar barrels of oil and 44 billion barrels of natural gas, comprising somewhere between 20 and 20. Uh, 10 and 20 percent of the world's reserves. But those numbers trace back to an estimate of undiscovered reserves that was published by the U.S. Geological Survey in 2008. And we link to that pu pu publication, but I do think it's important for both sides to understand that the promise of all these new oil and gas riches is still very speculative due to an outdated survey, and we are just looking at it from 2008. So there's a lot of things that are not considered. And you can see a picture of it here. This is literally, this is literally the document that all of the estimates come from. Nobody has gone into the sort of blue area in the middle of the map and actually explored for this oil. It is all based on a guesstimate by some very qualified scientists, but still a guesstimate. This was the U.S. Geological Survey saying that they estimated there were about 90 billion barrels of oil yet undiscovered in the Arctic as of 2008. 84 percent of which were offshore and of course those are the ones that matter right. because the ones on land or in territorial waters their ownership is already settled right. so it's not going to change it's the presumed underwater oil fields presumably out of the arctic ocean that are potentially up for grabs those are the things that actually matter because everything else is already settled and we say presumed and potential a lot here because when you read sources talking about how much oil and gas there is under the Arctic Ocean, they will all ultimately cite back to the U.S. Geological Survey. I guarantee you, every single one of them will. They, there will be different sources that say it, but they will all link back to this one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a point that the con in particular needs to keep in mind. Like, all of the pro's resource-related impacts may be discounted somewhat, particularly in the mind of, like, layperson judges, if you can sell them on the idea that we don't know that literally any of this stuff exists. Mm -hmm. It's based on one survey, right? One estimate by the U.S. Geological Survey. So if you can, I, I, frankly, it, there probably is a lot of oil out there and a lot of gas, right? But if you can sell the judge on the idea that this is a guess, I mean, you can dramatically knock down the weight of any resource-related impacts, mm -hmm. you know? So. Mm -hmm. Second, in addition to that, though, we have uh, resources, but we also have trade routes. So, Devin, tell us about trade routes. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, aside uh, from these oil reserves or apocryphal oil reserves, right. uh, you know, we need to look at some of the things that are actually opening up as the ice starts to melt. Uh, and the Arctic Institute pretty much does a good job of summing this up. There are two major trade routes that are opening up in the Arctic, one along the U.S.-Canadian coastline uh, and, and one along the Russian coastline. So, of course, this has to be a, a pitted fight of one versus the other. This can't just be some neutral lane. It, it can't be that easy. The first is the Northern Sea Route, which uh, was first opened by the Soviet Union in the 1930s, uh, and it has not been a reliable transit route for many decades due to ice coverage. However, with increasing melting of the polar ice caps, uh, the NSR is looking more and more like a potential trade route. Uh, and of course, as we move on, you know, into the further dec decades, so does the Northwest Passage. Uh, Canada claims that the Northwest Passage is located in inter uh, internal Canadian waters and therefore any ship is subject to Canadian law and sovereignty. Uh, Russia and Canada recognize each other's claim over their respective Ar Arctic passages, uh, which is somewhat important. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier with talking about Canada being in the Arctic, there is a continual dispute between Canadian claims over the Northwest Passage and the United States just sending ships in it over and over and over again. 
Um, and if you want to visualize what these routes look like, like I said, they go along their respective coastlines, both Russia and Canada. So here's this picture, uh, you know, this graph made by Sporthy Rahman and Hakai Magazine in graphic detail. And you also have this as yet unrealized but hypothetical future right. like transarctic shipping route. So if we really, really mess up the planet, like completely <laughs> melt all of the ice, we get an know, extra cross one. our yeah, fingers, we get a bonus, <laughs> we get a bonus <laughs> trade route. Yeah. So we, you know, we lose the ability to live on the earth. It's yeah. like civil, playing a game of civilization, yeah. but we gain a bonus trade route. So there you go. You know. <laughs> It's like double jeopardy. There you go. <laughs> so how do countries assert rights or potential rights over the Arctic assets and routes? Well, I mean, you're already seeing a lot of this, but let's look to UNCLOS. So UNCLOS provides uh, the legal mechanism under an international law by which countries can assert their claims to greater EEZ territory, which again is exclusive economic zones uh, in the Arctic. By submitting geological evidence that their shallow seafloor extends beyond the default 200 miles uh, in the treaty. So far, Russia and others have asserted that they have, an e that they have EEZ rights to various portions of the Arctic Ocean, uh, with Russia in particular asserting a massive claim, uh, as you can see here. Yep. Right? So this is by the AFP News Agency's uh, Twitter. Um, and you can see the red, right? Yeah. So the U.S. has this little sliver of red here, <laughs> mm -hmm. right, uh, that's, con that's contested. And Canada has a decent amount, and, Greenmark has, and, and Greenland, Denmark has a little bit. Um, and then Russia basically claims everything, right? They, they, they essentially claim like all of the Arctic in the, in the middle of the, of the area there. So, right. right. And you'll see more of this as we move into sort of the, uh, the pro-arguments about having the U.S. military there to conduct freedom of uh, navigation operations. It's not just claiming the middle of the Arctic Ocean, but also claiming the territorial waters for, you know, the northern sea route and just saying it's entirely Russian. Right. Um, but the United States, you know, in, in, in speaking with UNCLOS, has not even bothered to ratify uh, right. UNCLOS, much less submit lawful claims, although it does assert some limited claims uh, above Alaska, just not through legal means under UNCLOS. So that's why you see that, that graph having such a huge disparity between U.S. claims and Russian claims in the right. Arctic. Um, so one big question the Khan can raise, as we'll talk about later, if the United States hasn't bothered to join the treaty we use to divvy up rights in the Arctic, how could, we, how could it possibly justify ramping up its military to you know, defend rights in the Arctic? It doesn't make any sense. So with that, I guess it's time to finally start talking about the military. So let's talk a little bit about the status quo with the military in the Arctic. And this comes from uh, Brian Harris with Defense News in 2022, and it talks about the current White House Arctic strategy. And this strategy is an, an actual official document from the White House. If you haven't looked at it, it's going to be a big, you're, you're going to need to read it. It's a big part of every debate. We, you, you need to know what the status quo is in terms of plans. But as you can see here, we'll pop it up on the screen. The White House on Friday released a 10-year Arctic strategy emphasizing deterring increased Russian and Chinese activity in the region as global warming rapidly melts polar ice caps, dramatically transforming the environment. It talks about these four different pillars, of which one of which is U.S. military presence. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, the, in, in just a second. But obviously, this national strategy on the Arctic region. It's called, it's called the NSAR in many cases. It's really important because it gives you a roadmap of what increasing military presence is likely to look like in the real world. Like the pro can advocate for whatever it wants, but the White House has already told you if it's given its druthers, here's what we'll do, right? So one thing you might consider as the con is the idea of if, if the pro comes out and says we'd like to do some elaborate you know scheme or something there could be two responses one would be you know the rules say you can't run plans in pf which i don't know how much that's enforced in given places but the second thing is no you don't get to make up your own plan because the white house has already told you how we're going to do this you either do what the white house says or you don't but you don't get to make up a new third strategy because that's just not going to happen in the real world anyway what does the nsar say well it has four pillars climate, excuse me, security, climate slash environment, economic development, international cooperation. So we're obviously going to focus, of course, on pillar one, which is security. As you can see here is what it says. We will deter threats to the U.S. homeland and our allies by enhancing capabilities required to defend our interest in the Arctic while coordinating shared approaches with allies and partners and mitigating risks of unintended escalation. We will exercise U.S. government presence in the Arctic region as required to protect the American people and defend our sovereignty. More specifically, the NSAR lists three of what it calls strategic objectives, and they are improving understanding of the operating environment, exercising presence, and maximizing unity of effort. Uh, we'll put up on the screen a summary of what all these things say, but basically the first one is about investing in like detection and tracking threats. So this could be radar, this could be satellite surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big question as to whether that by itself would constitute a significant increase in, in military presence. Um, it certainly probably would be built by the military, but it 
would be a real tough topicality fight if you were just building radar and just doing satellite presence. You could possibly make the argument if you did enough of it, but that would be a little bit tough. Mm -hmm. Exercising presence is a little bit more concrete. It talks, for example, about expanding the U.S. Coast Guard's icebreaker fleet. We will talk about icebreakers a lot in this video. They're just ships that break ice. And they're, they're necessary to navigate in polar regions because regular ships can't do it and they get stuck and they get frozen. Uh, Russia has dozens of them. We have like two or three. So we're at a major deficit there. And, and you know, presence is another thing we're going to talk about, for example, freedom of navigation operations later on, or basically sailing U.S. ships through different waters to, to show that we can. So that certainly would be closer, I think, to military presence if we had a significant number of ships doing that, if we had a significant increase in Coast Guard icebreakers and things like that. And then maximizing unity of effort, that's just cooperating with our allies and things like that. So one big question we're going to talk about is, like, assuming this strategy gets done, would it be topical for the pro, right? Would it constitute the substantial increase in military presence that you need to affirm the resolution? Well, the argument, like I said, would be that it expands the icebreaker fleet. It also invests in detection, observation, and communication. The argument that it doesn't, like I said, would be that it really doesn't promise any new commitment of troops, of new ships, uh, beyond icebreakers, of course, of new bases, new ports, any of the other things that Russia has done. And so one thing you could do in terms of talking about substantial is you could say, look, here's, here's what Russia has done, which Devin's going to talk about in a minute. It's massive. It's concrete. If we don't do something like that, it's not a substantial increase. Uh, additionally, to be fair, the Arctic seems to be a low priority on both the U.S. national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Mm -hmm. So every year the United States publishes, in addition to this Arctic document, it publishes national security and defense strategies from the White House and the Pentagon, respectively. And as you see here from Colin Wall and Njord Wegg, I think that's how you say that's it? Good. Yeah, I do my best. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to butcher some Scandinavian yeah, yeah. names today, boys. <laughs> mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But from Wall and Wegg. Uh, in 2023, uh, what we're talking about here is notably the NSS, the National Security Strategy, lists the Arctic last in its overview of regional policies. The strategy is cautious about promising U.S. presence in the Arctic, saying it will only be exercised as required while reducing risk and preventing unnecessary escalation. So there's a real argument to be made about whether the current status quo in the United States, right, the NSAR, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy taken together, whether what they're proposing is like enough for a substantial increase. There's an argument they do and that there's an argument that they don't. And by the way, if you want a great and very current rundown on exactly what Russia is doing in the Arctic, this wall and wedge piece is outstanding. It explains what Russia is doing in terms of military investment in the Arctic on an extremely granular level, like what its motivations are and so on. If you read that piece and make notes and cut blocks, you'll be very well prepared to talk about Russia's capabilities. But to get you ready to do that, Devin, well, let's talk about our competitors. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Um, it's bad. It's actually <laughs> it's, terrible. it's terrible. It's really bad. Yeah. I, I will say, I, I don't know that, uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but in, in terms of that White House document, I mean, that's just a wish list as far as yeah, I'm concerned. Yeah. So it's not even being, I, I would say as the pro, you just walk up there and you say, that makes no sense because I can just, uh, you know. Like Congress hasn't funded yeah, it. Yeah, it's not yeah. been done yet. This happens right. every year, by the way. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of how we're competing with Russia and, and with China and maybe somebody else will join that's a quote-unquote near Arctic state, maybe Iran. Maybe we'll start fighting Canada. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long, we haven't done that in a while. But you know, we're, we're, we're running around like headless chickens. Um, the United States is laughably behind in the Arctic and it's definitely for a lack of trying. We have literally the biggest budget for the military in the entire world and we can't send more than three icebreakers up to the Arctic to move ships around. So according to an article written by Gronholt and Peterson, again, I, these Scandinavian What's well, Gronholt, names. Peterson, and Foot? <laughs> of course. Uh, in so. November 16th of 2022, writing for Reuters, they say that since 2005, Russia has reopened tens of Arctic Soviet era, uh, era military bases, modernized its navy, and developed new hypersonic missiles designed to evade U.S. sensors and defenses. Yeah. Uh, they write again that Russia has invested heavily in ports, infrastructure, and vessels to develop and protect the northern sea route. Last year, it upgraded the Northern Fleet to make the country, uh, the con make it the country's fifth military district. I mean, I don't know exactly what that means. In terms I, I of think Russian it just policy. basically means it's one of the five most important units in right. the Russian military, which it, is major, right? Right, and it's certainly not for us. I don't know. <laughs> but the upshot of all of these uh, new Russian investments is a major presence, right? I mean, you, it, it spells it out. The writing is on the wall. They're there, we're not. They've got us beat. Right. Um, a presence that dwarfs ours to an embarrassing extent. Uh, as Reuters writes, and they say that four Arctic experts say it would take the West at least 10 years to catch up with Russia's military in the region, 
if it chooses to do so, yeah. right? So we don't just have a, oh, we need to send more troops up there problem, or oh, we need more icebreaker problem. We have a massive problem that we need to solve with substantial investment right. uh, in that region. Devin, what is the silver lining to all of this? Uh, the, <laughs> there is no silver lining um, in any of this. Plain and simple, Russia has us beat. And they don't intend to cut us some slack whenever we eventually yell uncle in the region. But it isn't only Russia. Um, like I talked about earlier with this eclectic list of Arctic nations that, that, you know, just people across the globe, I guess, like I said, Iran is maybe next. Um, there are other nations involved with this, and of course, like we just mentioned, our second chief rival is here. Uh, massive investment in the region, either via the bankrolling of Russian projects or de facto military installments, have come hot on the heels of Russian presence in the region from China. Uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS for short, and we'll probably call that this yeah. for the rest of the yeah. video. They come up a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, just for any novices, just keep that in the back of your mind. They're a really good source. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they write April 18th of 2023 that left with few other options, China is stepping up its investments in Russia as it looks to Moscow as its strategic partner for the choice or, or, of choice in the Arctic. China has styled itself as a near-Arctic state and declared its ambitions to become a polar great power, whatever that may be. I'm guessing they're going to... It's like a polar bear. Yeah, buy up <laughs> all the polar an bears. An orange polar bear. Um, and a, a, a 2018 Arctic policy white paper asserts that developments in the region have a vital bearing on China and lays out Beijing's vision for utilizing the region's natural resources and shaping Arctic governance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a lot, right? That was a huge amount of information, and we didn't touch on a whole lot of stuff, right? <laughs> we didn't touch much on, you know, the issue of indigenous peoples, uh, colonialism. We didn't talk a lot about NATO. Uh, there's no way to do all of it. So this just illustrates the importance of doing your reading, you know, following the, the different rabbit trails because they could potentially become important. The more time you invest, the better. Mm -hmm. So with that, we'll take a quick break, come back and do just a few quick definitions and framing issues before moving on to the pro. So in addition with all the factual background and a plethora of information, now we're going to get to some definitions and framing, things that are really going to scope what this round is going to be uh, defined as. So I'm going to be talking about the Arctic. So mercifully, there is actually an objective scientific definition here. Thank the Lord. So according to the National Geographic Society in 2022, uh, the most, sci most scientists define the Arctic as the area within the Arctic Circle, a line of latitude about 66 and a half degrees north of the equator. Brett touched on this a little bit earlier. Within the circle uh, are the Arctic Ocean Basin and the northern parts of Scandinavia, Russia, Canada, Greenland, and the U.S. state of Alaska, and along with all the other uh, players that Devin touched on earlier. Uh, the Arctic is almost entirely covered by water, much of it frozen. Some frozen features such as glaciers and icebergs are frozen fresh water. So boom, the yeah. one certain thing we have in the entire debate, <laughs> yes. that is what the Arctic is. 66 and a half well, degrees. Let's do something that's not certain. Devin, what does it mean to substantially increase? <laughs> Um, I don't know that we'll ever find out. Uh, first is the meaning of substantially, right? So we yeah. typically put words like substantially in debate resolutions to prevent clever pro-debaters from trying to steal a win with a squirrely minimalistic advoca uh, advocacies or plans. Like so, you know, for instance, if you're the NAG, you're going to want to run some higher definition than just we put military more, you know, we put more troops there or something. Right. Like we don't just follow the White House plan. We, we need to put billions of dollars. You have to give some thing. sense of proportion. Exactly. Right. So substantial is a word where dictionary definitions don't provide a lot of help right. uh, in, in the way of bright lines. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a really topic specific kind of deal. Mm -hmm. um, Webster defines substantial as considerable in quantity, significantly great. Uh, right, <laughs> you know, thanks. Uh, Cambridge Dictionary defines substantially as uh, to a large degree, which again, great. Uh, that depends on how well you view large. I mean, a million dollars is a lot of money, mm. not for the military budget. That's right. Um, so there doesn't appear to be a topic-specific definition, like, for example, a specific military usage of the term substantially increase. Right. So There's I, no, like, military manual that says, here's what no. a substantial increase mm -hmm. is. But you're right. going to have to do a lot of the reading that we were talking about and sort of, uh, you're going to have to play by ear whether or not something is way more than what we've been doing or what historically we've planned to do in the Arctic. Um, so I think the key takeaway here is that there's no bright line on a substantial mm -hmm. right. increase. This is going to be up to every single debater mm -hmm. and every single round thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, th I think basically if it's, if it's truly trivial and really minimal and we're talking about millions as opposed to billions or maybe mm -hmm. a few billion dollars, then yeah, you might consider a topicality argument mm -hmm. about why that's not substantial. On the mm -hmm. other hand, if it is if it's marginal, you might just argue that the impacts are low, right? Mm -hmm. You might say, okay, that's topical, but that's not enough troops mm -hmm. to do anything. 
something like that. And may, maybe you could even give an example within round, right? Everybody in the room agrees that sending X amount of billions of dollars to Ukraine is a stamp to amount. Well, I think the, the example I'd probably give if I wanted to run a mm -hmm. topicality critique on this as the con is I'd, I'd talk about what Russia has done. Right. And I'd say that this is an example of what substantial is, mm -hmm. right? And if we're not, at least it doesn't have to be the same, it doesn't have to be equal, but if we're not in the same neighborhood mm -hmm. as that, then I think it's fair to say it's not substantial. So the next term is military presence. I got two quick points on this. First of all, it does not look like the, the term, the phrase military presence is what we call a term of art. In other words, it doesn't look like this phrase, military presence, has a specific well-settled meaning right. in like the real world literature in this topic area. Uh, to be fair though, the Union of International Associations, which is a very broad group, I guess, uh, they have an encyclopedia of world problems and human potential, which is also very broad. So I don't know how credible a source this is, but they do define foreign military presence in this way, as you can see. The presence of a foreign military power in a country may take the form of access to and use of military facilities or the actual presence of organized units of military personnel in foreign countries or the de deployment and per permanent activity of fleets outside their own territorial waters. So there's a lot of options here. However, to be fair, if you Google the term military presence and look at the results, they do pretty uniformly, the examples seem to refer to literal physical presence. So there's ships there, there's troops there, right? There's bases there. Not just we could go there if we wanted to, because the truth is the United States could go just about anywhere that mm -hmm. it wanted to in terms of its military. There's got to actually be some human beings, vehicles, equipment, you know, bases, things like that there. Yeah. Second issue on military presence that I think is important is for the pro to be able to tell a general story about what its increase in military presence is going to mean. So when you get up in crossfire and you're asked by the con, which you will be, right, what does this increase entail? You don't have to be able to give like a policy plan like you're in, in, in CX debate. In fact, you can't, arguably can't do that. But if you don't have any answer, right, if you can't give an intelligible picture of what it's like, then the con is going to make a lot of hay out of that and mm -hmm. point out that you don't know what you're voting for. So there's, there's just one good example here, if you want just a general one. This is from Jason Smith of the Modern War Institute in 2022. We'll mm -hmm. flash it up on the screen. But what it says is that, you know, it must begin building the means to combat, combat in the Arctic now, procuring additional icebreakers, uh, but in the, is, is a necessary for capability. Uh, the icebreakers are not the only capability needed. Most military equipment isn't designed to operate in Arctic environments, right. nor are most service members accustomed to the environment's extreme conditions. So you could say from this, look, what this means is we need icebreakers, we need to significantly alter and upgrade and retrofit U.S. equipment to operate in the Arctic, and we need to have a permanent like training facility there to train troops on how to do it. That mm -hmm. would just be one example. Um, but we need more than just like Coast Guard icebreakers. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the argument would be if you're going to start fighting in this climate, climate, you cannot start training after the bullets have started flying. Right. Anyway, this is just one example. We're going to talk about other specific examples, but my strong, my strong recommendation to the pro is have some narratively clear picture of what you're talking about. If it's the White House strategy, fine. If it's something more specific, fine, but have something. Right. So those are our definitions and framing, thankfully a little bit shorter. We will come back in just a second, and we will talk about some arguments on the pro. Okay, uh, let's jump into the part you've all been waiting for, some pro arguments. Uh, we have five big sort of areas of argumentation with a lot of little sub points. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. The first one I have is, is the idea that generally the U.S. is a less bad hegemon for the Arctic region than Russia is, right? And this is going to get into some storytelling, but I think it's really important and I think it's pretty good storytelling rather than just throwing things at the judge. So hear me out. When you boil it down, there are two major powers that are likely to compete for dominance in the Arctic, Russia and the United States. China will certainly have Russia's back when it's convenient for them. They'll bankroll them, but they are not a true Arctic state. They're not going to dominate the region on their own. Mm -hmm. Russia has made it very clear that the era of Arctic cooperation is over. We used to have that after the Cold War, but we don't anymore. So the only real choices that the United States has in the real world are, are twofold. One is to try to assert influence in the Arctic, and two is to cede the Arctic to Russia in terms of dominance, and perhaps by proxy somewhat to China, but mainly to Russia. 
Given these two options, either contest it or cede it, being the only two realistic arguments, a world where the United States is dominant, or at least influential in the Arctic, is clearly preferable to a world in which a rogue state like Russia exercises hegemonic power unchecked. And what this does, it's a really strong argument because it basically says, look, I don't have to prove to you that U.S. hegemony is great or good or the best thing for the world. I don't have to prove to you that they're the best for the environment or indigenous people or anything mm -hmm. like that. All I have to do is show you that the U.S. is, is less bad than Russia, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the real contest here. There's not going to be a detente. We're not going to go back to a world where we all show up for the Arctic Council and vote on things and play nice. We've got a choice and we need to choose the less bad option. So the first point you need to do to make this point, make, first argument you need to do to make this point is that cooperation is no longer a realistic option. And so I have this label that Russia has withdrawn from attempts to cooperate. And this is from the Congressional Research Service, an article called Changes in the Arctic from July of 2023. And as you can see here on the screen, it talked about how there used to be this era of cooperation in the Arctic, but over the last 10 to 15 years, the emergence of great power competition between the US, Russia, and China has introduced elements of cooperation. This has effectively shut down the Arctic Council, suspend its operation there. So basically what we say here, right, is diplomacy is broke down, broken down. We are not negotiating about things anymore. We, we are treating this as a competition. Um, additionally, Ukraine has just generally made Russia into more of a global pariah. Uh, no one's cooperating them, with them, certainly nobody uh, in NATO, none of the U.S.'s major allies. So the idea that Russia is going to come to the table and say, you know what, we really need to talk this out and share the Arctic. I mean, they can't even agree not to invade their neighbors. So that's not something that's going to happen. Also, we have the idea that, and Devin already talked about this, so I won't repeat it, Russia has clearly committed to an Arctic military buildup. Mm -hmm. We already showed you that. We've got dozens and dozens of bases. We've got updating their submarine fleet. We've got you know thousands of troops far beyond what the United States has, ports, things like that. So we won't rehash that and belabor the point. But in addition to that, Russia claims huge swaths of the Arctic Ocean as its own. And this is from Martin Broom uh, with Arctic Today in 2021. And what it says is Russia has formally enlarged its claim to the seabed in the Arctic Ocean all the way to Canada's and Greenland's exclusive economic zones. The claim extends from points near the North Pole to Greenland's and Canada's exclusive EEZs. Philip Steinberg, professor of political geography and director of the Center for Border Research at the University of Durham in the UK, estimated on Saturday that, Dur that Russia is enlarging its claim by approximately 705,000 square kilometers, covering 70% of the seabed in central parts of the Arctic. And that's that same map we showed you before where Russia has all this red area in which it is basically claiming most of the Arctic. So it's very clear that we have a great power con uh, competition going in the Arctic uh, and that hegemon status, or at least strongly influential status, is going to happen. There's going to be somebody. And there's only two realistic potential winners, the US and Russia. Those may not be the choices you want, but they're the choices you got, mm -hmm. right? So the only question that you have to answer in this round, judge, you basically say this, is which country would be better or less bad? Um, and the argument here would be basically that um, U.S. Arctic influence or hegemon status, hegemon just means, you know, sort of unchallenged dominance, right, is undeniably less bad than Russia. For all its flaws, the United States is a reasonably responsible, democratic, moderately stable international actor as opposed to an unstable rogue state autocracy that invades its neighbors without provocation. Right. So just to go into a little bit what, with what Brett said about really what Russia is all about, Russia is the world's most dangerous rogue state. So according to Ian Brimmer and Cliff Q. Cupchin? Cupchin? I don't maybe? know. Maybe? We don't know. Uh, Eurasia Group, risk one, rogue Russia. So we can see that Russia is rogue and they are the most uh, rogue state in the world. So they say that a humiliated Russia will turn from global power into the world's most dangerous rogue state, posing a serious security threat to Europe, the United States, and beyond. So just with that, we can see that Russia is so dangerous to the whole entire world. In other words, Russia is now a pariah state with nothing to lose from provoking other powers, as long as it avoids war. It will use what power it has to harass or intimidate smaller countries and to make life as miserable as possible for the U.S. and NATO states. Because right now they're in a corner. And what do, the, what do people do when they're in a corner and they have nothing else to do? They fight. So what Russia wants to do right now is throw some hands at some people. And the only way they can do that is through the Arctic. So while, now we see here is that Arctic resources would fuel Russian aggression elsewhere. So there's a lot of resources in the Arctic, and if we let them have these resources, then they're going to fuel that for the throwing of hands. So Eugene Rumer and others, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, 
Russia in the Arctic, a critical examination. What a title. In 2021, they say that Russia's investment in Arctic energy projects are part of its broader strategy toward Europe and the wider, wider world, but Europe is the most important arena in the Kremlin's strategic calculations. And essentially what this is telling you, look, is that it's what we already know. Russia is heavily dependent upon oil and gas revenues to mm -hmm. fuel its war machine. So you don't really have to care so much about the conflict in the Arctic. If you cede control of these mass reserves of oil and gas, this, what, this projected, what, you know, uh, 66 whatever mm -hmm. billion barrels or whatever it is uh, in, in the middle of the Arctic to Russia, you essentially give them an unlimited resource, mm -hmm. an unlimited ATM to, to use for purposes of fueling its war machine in Ukraine or wherever else it wants to go. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, we, this is, uh, I have this labeled as Russian dominance in the Arctic would disrupt NATO. This is from Heather Conley and others uh, from CSIS in 2020. It just talks about how Russia is returning to Cold War tactics, notably the concept of bastion defense in which it secures strategic territory to uh, secure its freedom of operation. It talks about how the Kola Peninsula boasts capabilities that can defend Arctic territory and project power out into places like Greenland, Iceland, and the United Kingdom, as well as Norway. And the basic idea here is that you know, ceding control of the Arctic to Russia gives this rogue state huge advantages if it wants to, to disrupt global trade and to disrupt NATO. And if they somehow make good on their claims to the Arctic Sea and all of these oil and gas resources flow to them, they basically have an endless source of resources to do that. If you want the Arctic shipping lanes to be free for global trade without the possibility of interference, uh, you would prefer any U.S. president to Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. If you want Arctic resources to flow to a regime that stabilizes rather than destabilizes the world, the U.S. is far from perfect, but it's way less bad than Russia. It's not actively invading its neighbors. Mm -hmm. And again, as we said earlier, this is a strong position for the probe because once you sell the judge on the idea that we're not going back to a world of cooperation, we're not going to a multipolar world, there's going to be a dominant power in the Arctic and you basically have two potential choices there. It's very easy to see why the United States is the less bad of those choices. It avoids all this need to explain these vague esoteric impacts like hegemony, right, and uh, economic competitiveness and what those mean. It basically says, Judge, you don't have to worry about the specifics or what those mean in the abstract. You just have to know that the U.S. having them is less bad than Russia having them. So let's move on to uh, ensuring the freedom of navigation. Obviously, how we touched upon earlier, Russia's claiming up a ton of territory in the Arctic, and that of course does include the Northern Sea Route. So this argument is going to focus a lot on trade routes through the Arctic, which should become more important as global warming reduce, reduces sea ice and potentially makes them navigable year round. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States needs to ensure that Russia does not seize control of these shipping lanes, uh, most notably the Northern Sea Route, like I just said, uh, as that would give it the ability to control and disrupt a major trade artery in the future all the way uh, from, the nor from North America to China. And, and one thing to note is the Northern Sea Route is the only operable sea route in the Arctic as of right now. Um, unfortunately, the United States is poorly equipped and poorly prepared to keep this route open for global trade. Um, to do that, it needs to increase its military presence in two ways. First, it needs to commit to Freedom of Navigation Operations, or FONOPS, which involves sailing U.S. warships through contested territories to assert navigational rights. And second, to consistently do that. Uh, it, it needs to dramatically expand its fleet of Coast Guard icebreakers and continually do these operations over and over and over again a capability that we don't have at the moment. Right. Um, so first, Russia is asserting legal authority to control sea lanes. Uh, the Maritime Executive uh, says that Russia tightens control over Northern Sea Route, and they write this in 2019, in a policy change first reported by uh, Izvestia. Izvestia? My goodness. Good th thank goodness we put out that blanket apology yes. at the very beginning. Mm, right. uh, the Russian government now intends to require foreign governments to provide 45 days of advance notice for warship vo voyages along the route. The United States believes these restric restrictions are inconsistent with international law, and the United States Navy regularly contests them as part of its broader Freedom of Navigation Operations program. Now, Rachel Elihus with the CSIS explains why, in addition to violating international law, uh, this is a problematic precedent. She writes that these are shifting currents in, in the Arctic. She writes in 2019 that through its Northern Sea Route administration, Russia charges application fees and associated harbor and navigation costs, which contradicts the UN law of the Sea Convention without consequences. Um, by doing so, Russia is gradually setting a pattern of behavior designed to codify by customary practice the internal uh, nature 
uh, of and its sovereign control over the NSR. And that's what a lot of this is about. That's what a lot of military presence is about, not just in the Arctic, but around the world. You get people used to the idea that you have control or domination over an area such that it's generally seen by, by different you know, regimes that there's no point in contesting it. And that's what Russia is trying to do here. Right. In other words, Russia is gradually setting the precedent for treating the NSR, which potentially will be one of the major trade routes uh, globally over the next century as a sort of toll road where it gets right. to decide who can pass and who can't and what they can carry and how much they have to pay. It's not hard to see how a rogue state actor with you know, predatory ambitions like we've seen in Ukraine would use this leverage uh, to economically cripple its rivals in the polar region and elsewhere. And if not just cripple them, but to just hamstring them. I mean, to just put up these fines and whatever to get as much money as they can because they have the ability to do it. But the good news is we have a solution. That is correct. And the solution is increased U.S. military presence, which can effectively challenge this problem. The U.S. has a storied history of calling bluffs like this. We continually carry out freedom of navigation operations or phone ops uh, in Chinese or Iranian dominated uh, straits. These operations are nothing, if not essential, to maintaining adherence to international law. According to Dale Stevens, in writing for the Naval War College in 2006, he writes this, that the Freedom of Navigation program has a critical place in the dynamic of international legal rule determination. The program draws considerable support from International Court of Justice, Jurisprudence, and has been successful in ensuring conformity in legal standards. And PhoneOps historically has, have been effective at ensuring free navigation of trade routes, not just in the United States, but for the entire world. The problem is, though, that we can't do phone ops. We can't do freedom of navigation in the status quo without investing in additional military presence. So this is from Andrei Todorov in 2022. And it says, analysis shows the U.S. Navy would have only a few options for a potential operation assertion. Uh, the most viable of them is to basically sail through the eastern part of the NSR, but what he talks about is how we can't do that most of the year, right, because we don't have the icebreakers to actually get the vessels through. In short, to assert the right to freedom of navigation along the northern sea route, the United States needs to, one, decide that it actually wants to do that, right, that it wants to do regular navigation operations in the first place to assert a right to navigate this, um, this important, or potentially important route. Number two, it needs to invest uh, in strengthening of U.S. warship hulls, which what's called ice strengthening, which was something we currently don't do. So they're going to need to be retrofitted to actually, even with an icebreaker, to sail through icy waters. And number three, we're going to have to have a major investment in U.S. Coast Guard icebreakers. As we said earlier, we only have a handful of them, not enough to successfully conduct these op operations on a repeated basis. Mm -hmm. And that would just be the operation itself. As uh, Rachel Elahus and others noted in 2019, we would also need a broader military presence in the region to back up our claim. And what she says here is that a successful phone op, freedom of navig navigation operation, will require detailed planning and it'll basically require all of the branches of the military to be prepared to back us up if we're challenged. In mm -hmm. other words, if we sail a vessel through there and it's actually attacked, we need to have, you know, ballistic missiles. We need to have detection. We need to have things like that ready to go. We cannot make a threat like that as an empty threat, especially if Russia knows that it's an empty threat. Finally, it's not just navigation along the northern sea route. It's also deterring general, like, low-level harassment and intimidation tactics against private companies and others operating in the Arctic, similar to what China does routinely, say, to other countries in the South China Sea. So this is from David Orswald, War on the Rocks in 2022. It's called A U.S. Security Strategy for the Arctic. By the way, this is a very good article. I will say reading the whole thing on this is probably a good idea. Well, what he talks about is to deter Russia and China from threatening U.S. interests in the Arctic, the U.S. military needs to demonstrate presence in the region beyond submarines. Submarines can deter large-scale attacks but are less useful against coercion and intimidation. Deterring Russia will require Navy surface assets, manned and unmanned, and a more robust air and ground presence in the European and North Atlantic Arctic. It is difficult to police fisheries, monitor potentially hostile surface ships, or target airborne intruders, things like drones, right, without capabilities in this region. Um, as Admiral James Fago said, in order to deter, you have to be present. You have to be there and you have to get there quickly. The bottom line is this is a short, coherent story you can tell to the judge. Russia wants to choke off this key new trade route. It is not speculation. They're already doing it. They have laws that have asserted the right to charge tolls and to decide who can go through it. We have a means of solving this in other parts of the world. It's freedom of navigation operations, right? But they can't work in the Arctic unless we invest in things like retrofitting our ships to sail through ice, new Coast Guard uh, icebreakers, and a general presence there to back ourselves up. 
So that's basically a coherent argument you can make and tell a story uh, to the judge that's very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third point that we're going to make here is preventing nuclear escalation. Uh, the basic story here is that the Arctic is absolutely essential to Russia's capacity to strike U.S. territory in a nuclear exchange. And while a U.S.-Russia nuclear exchange would probably mean the end of the world, regardless, the important impact is that when this ability goes unchecked, it gives Russia the confidence to be more aggressive mm -hmm. in its uh, right. dealings with the United States and others. Um, that's why it's critical for the United States to possess and demonstrate both to Russia and U.S. allies the ability to mitigate or eliminate Russian nuclear forces wherever they exist. Uh, this is why, for example, we station U.S. nuclear missiles uh, in, in Turkey and target some of them at Russian ICBM silos. We want Russians, or we want Russia and the rest of the world to know that if it comes to nuclear war, we're going to degrade your capacity to inflict damage as fast as possible. So don't get overconfident. The problem with this, though, is that unfortunately the United States does not have this capacity in the Arctic, right. where much of Russia's nuclear strike capacity resides. So we need an increased military presence to address that, uh, that key security deficit. So first, the Arctic is key to Russia's nuclear strike capabilities. The Carnegie Endowment writes in March 29th of 2021 that Russia has three key military interests in the Arctic. Foremost is securing the second strike cap capability of its ballistic missile submarines, SSBNs for short, uh, force on the Kola Peninsula, home to seven of the Russian Navy's 11 ballistic missile submarines. And so not only is Russia you know, implementing a majority of its nuclear capabilities in this region, and they've been pushing more and more into the region as they expand, and the Russian military has also set out to modernize its ballistic strike force via the implementation of new missiles. You know, what are these new missiles, you ask? Well, they're, they're missiles that go faster than the speed of light, or, you know, or speed of sound, my yes, bad. speed of sound. Yeah. Speed not of light would be really dangerous. Yeah, pretty terrible. Yeah, it'd be but bad. Like, break the laws of physics. <laughs> yeah, we don't need that. So. But anyways, uh, you know, and I'm not going to read all these quotes, but the point should be pretty simple. Russian capabilities are not only above the United States in the sense that they you know, exist in the Arctic or that a lot of them are already there in the Arctic, they beat us technologically in the simple sense. Even the, if these were deployed off the coast of Florida, we wouldn't. They're be. not just numerically superior, they're right. also technologically superior. Right. 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 Um, but the United States is totally unprepared to respond to this threat, is, is what we've got here under this next section. The United States is essentially bringing a knife to a hypersonic missile fight, which, I mean, it sounds corny, but that's <laughs> literally what we're doing. Um, Jacob Gronholt Peterson, <laughs> I'm sorry, I really uh, apologize to whoever this foosh lady is. <laughs> Willatis? Willatis. Willatis? Yeah. Uh, they write for Reuters uh, essentially saying that the United States lacks preparedness for, for any, first of all, for any nuclear strike uh, from Russian territory into the Arctic, through over the Arctic into U.S. territory but also, of course, for hypersonic missiles. They further say that the Arctic is currently a dark area on the map. They say that it's so vast and with few civilian surveillance resources. And they, of course, say that a better Arctic domain awareness is necessary to detect and address Russian and Chinese capabilities to launch advanced missiles. The star on the Christmas tree, however, is in this article by the U.S. Air University. They say that the uh, Russian hypersonic missiles can strike Alaska with little indication or warning, and that the NWS is more than 30 years old and incapable of effectively tracking and warning against modern hypersonic missiles. So to boil that down, what this means is that Russia could and would send a flurry of nuclear weapons right to our command centers, nuclear silos, operation centers, and nuclear fleet within literal seconds, you know, with literal seconds on the clock for our response. We're literally, by not investing in the Arctic, setting ourselves up for nuclear conflict with both hands tied behind our backs. This could mean a near flawless nuclear victory for the strongest and most volatile nuclear power in the world, and it could mean millions dead in America and billions dead across the world that eat American food. The bottom line here, I think, is the idea that it, it really, it's only incidental that these threats are in the Arctic. These, submar these Russian submarines and these missiles could be stationed anywhere. They could be in the middle of the Atlantic, they could be in the Pacific, they could be, you know, in the Baltic Sea, wherever, right? The fact that they exist means that the United States has an obligation to begin working on some way to respond to them. Russia knows we don't have one. Our allies know we don't have one. It just so happens that they're in the Arctic, and what that means is that we have to invest in the Arctic uh, in, in, in some way in order to be able to deter and respond to them. So next on the list, I have got environmental benefits. Tanner, this is yours. Right, and this is kind of a slowdown of pace. I know that was a very uh, intense contention about nuclear war, but this one really slows it down if you want to, you know, get the pace for maybe just the con to respond to something. Like, there was, that was such a big contention. So here you would think, like, well, crap, like, probably putting military in the Arctic has environmental harms. But here we can actually see that there are environmental benefits. So the first is that there is a need for icebreakers to conduct 
research. As you could probably imagine in the Arctic, there is a lot of research that goes on in there. And without these icebreakers, which is a military capability, we can't do vital research going on into the Arctic. So according to Julia, I don't know her last name. Neshawant? Neshawant. And Andro, <laughs> Andro Mathewson? Yes, them. Fantastic people. They talk about how expanding the United States icebreaker fleet is important to research. They say that icebreakers often serve as moving research institutions and platforms with teams conducting scientific research in the Arctic, including vital climate change focused research, helping to tackle one of the region's largest threats. So we can see that we need these icebreakers. If we don't have them, then vital research uh, surrounding climate change can't happen. Ha can't happen. So to get out there and do research requires an icebreaker, which is an expensive military piece of equipment, which falls into the umbrella of substantially increasing military presence. And in contrast to this, Russian aggression actually hinders this climate research. Uh, according to Juliana Conrad from CBC Radio, uh, she talks about how this actually happens. And essentially, she says, and the quote is on the screen, but when Russia invaded Ukraine, the international scientific community lost access to over half of the Arctic, which was a massive portion of polar region that lies in Russia. And that, as a result, results in them not having research capabilities in the Arctic. And it, it, was, a, it was bad for all these researchers. And I agree, Tanner, I agree, basically, this is a smaller contention, but it is a good change of pace. Mm -hmm. It's something maybe that uh, the con won't see coming because I think they'll probably assume that environment is their territory. But if you can use this to sort of push back and, and, and reduce that to a standstill, basically make it a draw, you've got two simple arguments. Mm -hmm. One is icebreakers are military equipment. They're needed to do climate research. Let's get some more of them. It's small and mm -hmm. it's intuitive. And also, Russia has the ability to shut off about half of the Arctic to critical climate research. Mm -hmm. To just take it off the map that and you know such that we can't use it mm -hmm. those are two good ways even if you don't use them as contentions just potentially as blocks to say right. look at best climate is a wash right mm -hmm. we need to get up there and do research and by allowing russia to have a hegemony over the arctic we, we jeopardize that and by not having icebreakers we jeopardize that as well mm -hmm. so the last one i have is uh that it's uh u.s military investment is actually better for indigenous peoples Honestly, while I certainly agree that the rights of indigenous peoples are very important, I don't know that I see them as a huge impact on the resolution. First, let me explain why. Indigenous nations and tribes live, hunt, and fish in land or in coastal territorial waters, which means that their fate is largely going to be dictated by whatever country they happen to live in. So indigenous people in Russia will be treated however Russia treats indigenous folks. Those in the US and Canada will be treated how those countries treat indigenous folks. In other words, which country has dominance or hegemony over the Arctic in general is probably not gonna have a huge amount of impact on their daily lives. But because we know again, right, that con teams are probably gonna raise indigenous issues, mm -hmm. I hear again, I think it's important for the pro to be able to push back and at least make this sort of a 50-50 kind of a wash argument that takes away the heavy impact from the con. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to do that is by arguing that the U.S., while it is, let me be clear, mm -hmm. far from perfect in its treatment of indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. at least in the present tense, here again is a lot less bad than the alternative, which is Russia. Mm -hmm. This is from Mansur Miravalev in Al Jazeera in 2022, and it's talking about how in Russia, in, indigenous defenders of land rights are facing severe persecution, mm -hmm. intimidation, exile, things like that. It talks about how in the warming Arctic, we're seeing you know, more exploitation and business exploitation in the northern parts of Russia, mm -hmm. that these people are ignoring the rights of indigenous peoples under various UN documents and treaties, and that is this continues to happen, indigenous activists are fighting the encroachment with things like, you know, that you would expect to see, protest rallies, lawsuits, social media posts, drawing attention to the issue. But in response to that, what they're seeing is harassment, intimidation, arrests, surveillance by police, intelligence services, smear campaigns, and you can see all the other things we see here. People are basically, in some cases, potentially even being disappeared. People are just sort of being, you know, pulled off the map, as this tends to happen in Russia. Just the other day, we had uh, what's his name? Prigozhin. Prigozhin, yeah. yep. mm -hmm. who, whose plane mysteriously crashed. Very ostentatiously. What are the yeah. chances? All these people falling out of windows in <laughs> Russia. It's a very dangerous place. Mm -hmm. But these people, all kidding aside, are being severely persecuted, right, for asserting right. the rights of indigenous people. And I think the basic argument here is, here again. 
There may not be a universe where indigenous people realistically are going to be treated with the dignity they deserve, but judge, you have to choose between a world in which the United States might engage in more economic development than they would like to see, but at least we'll treat them, you know, we'll not actually arrest them for protesting. We'll not send them to jail for social media right. posts. The alternative is a world where Russia is more dominant in the Arctic, right? And in that world, situations are worse for indigenous folks. So the basic argument is that, you, you know, you, it's, it's, it's the alternative is no better for them, and I think that's a powerful defensive point. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are the pro arguments. We will come back in just a second and talk a little bit about the con. Okay, last but not least, at least before final thoughts, let's talk about some con arguments. Uh, I think we have five or six sort of big headings on this one. The first one is the costs and trade-offs of militarization. Now, I don't know if this is going to be a single discrete contention, but I think it's really important to start by laying some groundwork on what the like actual financial trade-offs of Arctic militarization are. A substantial increase to a multi-trillion dollar operation, and that is what the U.S. military is. The annual budget may be hundreds of billions, but it is a multi-trillion dollar operation. Mm -hmm. Is not going to be free or cheap, and the con needs to be able to articulate exactly what a substantial increase means in practical terms. So we start with the idea that generally the U.S. spends absurd amounts of money on its military in the status quo. This is from the Peter G. Peterson Foundation uh, from 2023, and it just says the United States spent $766 billion on national defense during fiscal year 2022, which is 12% of federal spending. And remember, this money doesn't magically appear, right? It, it trades off against other things. So this is according to the Treasury Department in 2023. It says that half of the discretionary budget of the United States goes toward military spending. When we say the discretionary budget, we mean basically everything other than entitlements, like Social Security and things along those lines that we cannot not pay. In other words, everything we get to decide on, half of it goes to the military. If you look at this graphic from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities in 2022, you see these numbers on spending. Defense is there at 13 percent. And look at all of this stuff down at the bottom education, transportation, natural resources and agriculture, science, medical research, law enforcement, international spending like aid, and literally everything else. When you add all of it up, you're, you're totaling up to the same amount as military spending. Um, and so what you can see is that you know, we, we have all of these things, science, medical research, education, all of those things are, are significantly less than what we spend on the military. And I would emphasize this point, especially with layperson judges. Billions of dollars, which it certainly would have to be to be significant, right, be substantial, in new Arctic spending is going to have to come from one of two places. It's either going to have to come from within the military budget, which means we're going to have to be less prepared somewhere else. We're going to have to take away from military preparedness somewhere else or, in, for, or against some other threat. Or it's going to have to come from outside of the military budget, which means we're going to have to further underfund things like transportation, housing, education, or some other program. And if you want just a very tangible, specific example of a trade-off, there is this from NPR in 2023. It talks about the retrofitting of Navy destroyers for the capability of doing like ice-breaking hulls costs well over $1 billion to construct each one, or about $5 billion for three destroyers. And I know that when we start talking about the military, we start thinking, well, a billion dollars, that's nothing. That's a trivial amount. But when you put it in concrete terms, $5 billion is about one-fourth of what the group Giving Compass says it would take to wipe out homelessness in America permanently. The scale of what we spend on the military is just so much greater than what we spend on any social issues. Like again, like wiping out homelessness. Bill, the other topic we're doing this month is a right to housing in Lincoln Douglas. Literally building houses for every homeless person in the United States. That's what you trade away, or you trade away a fourth of that to just build and retrofit a handful of these destroyers. So like we said a minute ago, I don't know that we need to spell out a specific contention here on cost. You can think about what that might be. There are different ways that you can use it. But I do think that every con, right, needs to be mindful of the absurd amount of money that the U.S. spends on defense and needs to get the judge away from this mindset where it's just endless magical money. And you need to think, like you can find good trade-offs. Ask the pro, where is this money coming from? What are you going to give up, right? Where, you know, are we going to give up military preparedness? Are we going to give up social programs and see if they have an answer? And if they don't, that's something you can make some hay on. So anyway, that's what I got on that. So on the second point that we have, that is going to be the benefits of Arctic development are overstated. Um, Alec Evans, uh, writing for the Responsible Statecraft in 2021, says that the United States has far fewer motives to militarize the Arctic than any other Arctic state. 
Despite its enormous size and resource-rich population, Alaska is only the country's sixth largest oil producing state with the nation's 11th largest uh, proven natural gas deposits and 1% of America's coal. And although there are massive untapped hydrocarbon deposits off the state's coast, the utility of extracting these resources is questionable. Given the United States is already a net exporter of energy, most of these deposits lie in protected areas and natural resource rents of all types compose a paltry 0.6% of the country's GDP. In other words, yes, there is theoretically a lot of oil and natural gas in the Arctic, but the United States hasn't asserted claims much beyond its own coastal waters. Uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, it's not even a member of the treaty UNCLOS which, that would allow it to do that. So unless and until the United States actually asserts broader rights to the Arctic Ocean, and there's no indication that it's going to do that, right. any suggestion that the United States will somehow go out and drill for these billions of barrels that, again, may or may not exist, right. um, based on entirely one study according to the U.S. Geological Survey in 2008, all of this, you know, just thinking and pondering, it would be a waste, and t a waste of time. The second thing, of course, is that trade routes still don't justify expansion in the region. Many view the Northwest Passage that borders Alaska, as uh, Alec uh, continues on here, many view the, pa the Northwest Passage that borders Alaska as a trade route of increasing importance that warrants substantially increasing fortification. However, there is limited utility in deploying military units on its behalf as well. The route is handicapped by stubborn sea ice deposits, the inconvenient paths that shipping must use, and a critical shortage of supporting infrastructure, not to mention that Canada claims most of the route as its sovereign territory and holds more influence over it regarding, uh, regardless of the validity of its assertion. Even if these pitfalls are addressed, it's unclear how a bolstered military presence could help facilitate northerly trade in the first place. So on this point, I think the basic idea is that the United States and other countries already have a perfectly feasible shipping routes all across the world that are never blocked by ice and don't have to traverse through Russian coastal waters and spark up any formal conflict in that region. So one very practical point to make is why fight over this particular less than ideal route? It's not like it's some essential choke point in the Su like the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal. It's just one more option. And the, North sea, the Northern Sea Route specifically runs right by Russia. So it's a less than ideal option under even the best of circumstances. And I think the takeaway on this is very simple, which is like in PF or any form of debate, don't be afraid to ask the dumb questions or make the, the simplistic argument. And on this, the simple argument might be why this particular trade route, why this less than ideal, you know, much of the year it's frozen, right, particular trade route. There are other perfectly usable trade routes all over the world. The United States successfully ships things. Other countries successfully ship things all the time. Now, look, your opponent might be well prepared. They might be able to come in and say, oh, there's this very specific economic benefit. There's this increase in competitiveness. There's this reduction in cost. But they very well might not. And an intuitive argument that, like, look, you are essentially willing to risk major global conflict, potential nuclear war with Russia, over just another trade route, and a trade route that's less than ideal, that's frozen much of the year, or at least part of the year. Why is this particular route so important when, again, we've got the entire rest of the ocean? The United States is a bi coastal state that can ship from anywhere. It can ship from the East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, places like that. Why is it so critical that we fight over this? And I think that question, particularly if an opponent's not prepared for it, is a good one. Right, and this kind of goes back to this, but the next point we have is countering Russia just does not justify building up the mil military in a substantial way in the Arctic. So this is pretty much the most prevalent justification to bolster the United States military presence in the Arctic is to counter the Russians, Russia's military uh, buildup there as well. But what we see here is that Russia's militarization of the region has little to do with the United States and its national security ambitions. There is simply more at stake for Russia's own economy and not the United States. Russia's Arctic coastline is 15 times longer than the United, United States equivalent. It is Arctic territory contains 48 billion barrels of oil. And, and that's oil, just its territory. Just that's its not territory. going out into like international waters. That's right? right. Yeah, and 43 trillion square meters of natural gas. Resources which the Russian government and economy are highly dependent upon. So that also, all of those things, is 13% of its GDP as a country. So in other words, just talking about the oil and gas in Russia's undisputed territory, it has every incentive to defend that to the bitter end. Right. And it's not something we could ever seize or exploit. It's in their territory. It's, We're never yeah. getting that stuff. The bear is guarding all of that stuff, and we aren't going to get it. So there's no reason to build up our military there anyway. 
So if there is extreme paranoia around defending it, and we're never going to seize control of it, then why move into a neighborhood where they would have very limited reasons to fight? But they have every possible incentive to defend it. So nobody likes Russia, but you have to pick your battles. Right. There's no sense in adding an even 1% increase to the risk of a global nuclear conflict if your opponent has everything to fight over and you have far, far less. Yeah, to. it is their first tier A1 asset. It is mm -hmm. our third, fourth, fifth tier asset. Right. And the risk, any risk of nuclear exchange, any risk of global war over that is really just not worth it is mm -hmm. the argument I think that the con makes here. And I think it's intuitively pretty strong. Mm -hmm. So third, the U.S.'s global dominance makes increased presence in the Arctic unnecessary. That's the next claim. The United States is a global superpower that spends more on its military than the next 10 countries combined. We just talked about that, including more than three times China's expenditures and 10 times Russia's expenditures in 2022, according to Dave Lawler, writing in Axios uh, in April of 2023. Our chief rival in the Arctic is currently watching its military be decimated and humiliated in Ukraine, thanks in part to U.S. and NATO equipment, but also to the fact that their armed forces are poorly trained and badly led. Okay. Counter that to the fact that the U.S. can send its vessels to navigate literally anywhere it wants. Mm -hmm. The United States sails its vessels through the South China Sea all the time just to show China that it can do it. And do you know what China does to those vessels? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> it sits there and it takes it because it knows it has to, USA. right? USA, <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> I don't mean to be jingoistic, but that's what happens. Our Navy is larger than the next 13 navies in the world combined in terms of tonnage, right? And that's how big the vessels are, not how many little boats we have. Mm -hmm. It is four times the size of the Russian Navy by tonnage. It is far more modern and advanced. And if Ukraine is any indication, it would absolutely annihilate the Russian Navy in any direct confrontation, partly because Russia's naval numbers are inflated by these small ships meant to fight in places like the Black Sea, where mm -hmm. ours are basically missile destroyers and aircraft mm -hmm. carriers and things like that. As they David Axe explains in Forbes in 2020, the rusting, shrinking Russian fleet poses no serious threat to American and allied convoys, which have 12,000 offensive missiles compared to 3,300 for Russia. Mm -hmm. Additionally, Russia's overall military strength in the Arctic is wildly overstated by hawks and other proponents of militarization. This is from Robert English in Arctic Today, talking about why an Arctic arms race would be a mistake. And it says that more than a decade of investment in rebuilding its Arctic military presence still has not returned Russia to the level of the 1980s. So we talk about all of this growth and what we're really doing is, is barely returning to the status quo. Its problem-plagued northern fleet is also puny, just a few dozen surface ships and a similar number of submarines. Many of these vessels are obsolescent and notwithstanding the hype about recent exercises, constitute a force mainly for coastal defense. Similarly, Russia's Arctic air power is far outclassed by NATO's lacking both the range and sophistication of things like F-22s and F-35s and it goes on from there. In other words, we don't need to station a bunch of troops or ships in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Russia is well aware that on the day it tries to interfere with a U.S. flagged vessel's navigation or stop the U.S. from building an oil platform in international waters, right, that everyone has access to, it would be decimated by a vastly superior force. Mm -hmm. It has known that for a long time, but it certainly knows that now after Ukraine. We're not even fighting in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We're giving Ukraine our used tanks, our used fighter jets, and our other used weapons, and they are absolutely wiping the floor with Russia right on their own doorstep. Mm -hmm. Russia is acutely aware that it cannot battle the United States, and so there's no need for us to go up there and do a big show of force. When you're strong, you don't have to go puffing your chest out everywhere in the world to prove that you're strong. Weak people have to puff their chests out, not the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's just like it's never going to attack a NATO member or never use a tactical nuke. Despite getting obliterated by the U.S. and NATO, by our, at least by U.S. equipment in Ukraine, Russia blusters and it threatens, but it has a proven record of backing down when the U.S. in any way pushes it back. So that's the question. Why bother, right? Why, if, we, if we want to preserve our territories, if we want to navigate, if we want to you know, be able to drill for oil in our own waters, which we may do one day, the odds of Russia ever contesting that especially after the lesson it's learned in Ukraine, are basically zero. So why dump billions and billions of dollars into a military escalation when Russia knows very well that on the day we want to show up there, we will be able to do it? 
So again, this is a change of pace, especially compared to the last point, but this point here is gonna be talking about the harm to indigenous peoples mm -hmm. in the particular area. So the basic idea here is that major military expansion in say, Northern Alaska, inherently disrupts the way of life for indigenous peoples there. First, these people heavily depend on sustainable interaction with nature. They fish, they hunt caribou and reindeer. All of these things are inherently disrupted by construction of military bases and right. bringing in uh, thousands of troops. Additionally, there is inherent harms to sovereign status of these groups. While native groups aren't totally sovereign like separate countries, the U.S. and Canada have promised to give them a great deal of autonomy and control over their lands. And when the federal government shows up and starts stationing tens of thousands of troops, all governed by federal laws and regulations, the sovereignty just goes straight out the window. Yeah, and don't discount the impact of that, like the mm -hmm. dignity impact. We have done so much in this country mm -hmm. to strip native peoples of their dignity. Mm -hmm. Like even if there weren't a measurable economic impact or a health impact or anything like that, just the idea of again telling them, oh, we promised you sovereignty, but we're gonna take it away from you again. We're gonna stick a military base here. Mm -hmm. The stripping of dignity, it, it, I think is a powerful impact. A lot of judges would, would, it would resonate with a lot of judges. So. Right, like learn, learn from history here. Right. Like, take it and learn from it and go forward with it. So, and again, this isn't just speculation. It's what has actually happened in previous Arctic military buildups in Canada in the mid 20th century. Uh, not going to read the entire block of quotes. It's a very long quote, but we'll put it up on the screen here. And as you'll see, Canada's Arctic militarization was absolutely devastating for indigenous peoples in the region and left behind scars that lasted for decades. And this card is a good answer to Pro's likely argument that we can just build military facilities around indigenous people and it won't affect them at all. And the answer is empirically, Canada shows it doesn't work like that. Right. Um, Yevis Engler, Canadian dimension, uh, he talks about how can Canada's military buildup in the Arctic threatens climate and indigenous people. So again, the whole block of text is up there, but basically uh, there's this tribe, it's called the Inuit tribe, uh, and in Canada, in the 1950s, Canada basically treated them horribly. Um, and if history teaches us every, anything, we should not be building up the military again due to the very thing that's happened before. So seven decades ago, in the 1950s, uh, the Inuit tribe were whipped away from their homes to establish Canadian forces dominion uh, uh, over the far north. Um, and then to solidify the base uh, and Ottawa's territorial claims, 87 Inuit living in northern Quebec were forcibly relocated 2,000 kilometers north to Resolute Bay in Ellesmere Island in 1953. Built in the early 1950s to counter the purported Russian menace, the Distant Early Warning, or the DEW, line was a network of 63 radar and communication stations built over a 4,500 kilometer stretch in the Arctic Circle. So they built a bunch of infrastructure in the area with which what the pro is advocating for. The pro is advocating for this very thing that we did seven decades ago. And this, magic pro this massive project left deep social scars and ecological calamity. And also with that, there was environmental harm. The environment was destroyed. There was depleted fish stocks, which harmed uh, the indigenous people's everyday of life of fishing and agitating caribou and other game, which again, harms their hunting. And there was major stars physically and emotionally. Uh, the DEW line was abandoned a few years after being completed and an incredible amount of material was left behind. So they saw this amount of uh, military that was left behind and there was rotted vehicles and lakes, containers full of hazardous materials in dumps, arsenic and PCBs or, or polychlorated uh, biphenyls which is a harmful industrial chemical very very bad so what we can see here is what the pro is advocating for is substantially increasing the military in the area I think the argument is just like if the pro says well we could hypothetically do this in a way that respects the right of indigenous peoples like you don't get to fiat that mm -hmm. right right you, you get to do military expansion or not how it happens is up to the people that do it and in the history of the United States we've just never done that mm -hmm. we've never cared about the rights of indigenous peoples and so we should expect that when we send a military base mm -hmm. up there or a port or whatever we do right we should expect that they will behave similarly to how how they have behaved toward indigenous people in the past. You don't get to wave your magic fiat wand and say it's gonna be different this time unless you have evidence it's gonna be different this time and there's no evidence like that. Right, right. So the next one I have is jumping, we're, we're jumping the gun by failing to explore any legal or diplomatic options. And again, as the, law, as the resident lawyer, I'm gonna talk about this one. The basic argument here is that the United States hasn't even ratified the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS, much less submitted any claims to territory 
territory under that treaty. This is the recognized legal means for asserting territorial rights in the Arctic. Everybody, even Russia, right, follows it. By failing to proceed under UNCLOS, the US, the U.S. escalates to a military confrontation without even trying legal means or diplomatic means, and thus it not only fails to use a good option, it also undermines respect for international law. So according to Carnegie Europe, they talk about how diplomacy is actively working in the Arctic right now. I'm not going to read all this, but you can see it talks about Russia abiding by the rules laid down by UNCLOS and basically following those rules, you know, and, and that even though Russia is, you know, a rogue actor, disputes still get lawfully settled. Russia still comes to the table, says, here's our claim, and so far, at least, is abiding by international rules on this. So the basic argument here would be, look, as bad as we think Russia is, even they have ratified the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, and even they have submitted their territorial claims to uh, the body that was created by UNCLOS for claiming additional territory in the Arctic. And so far, they haven't tried to, like, physically claim any territory that they haven't been legally granted. The United States States, by contrast, has basically thumbed its nose at the whole process. It hasn't bothered to ratify UNCLOS, much less do the geographical surveying necessary to make legal claims for territory in the Arctic, much less submit those claims for lawful determination to the actual tribunal that does it. Mm -hmm. So the idea of arming up to defend your territory in the Arctic when you literally have not tried to assert any claim to territory in the Arctic seems kind of bizarre. Mm -hmm. If you wanted an analogy for this, imagine you had like a dispute with your neighbor about like where your property line was between your two lots and instead of going to the courthouse and looking at the, the official county records or you know even filing a lawsuit to correct where the line was you just went straight out and started laying down like traps and deploying like <laughs> attack dogs and buying up guns and put a trebuchet out there to launch rocks at your opponent's home right the alternative to diplomacy in addition this is another point the alternative to diplomacy is provoking russia further the fear that Russia has of NATO should not be exacerbated and it should not be underestimated. Russia is already basically, you'd say, on NATO's leash. And if NATO, specifically the more powerful, most powerful nation in NATO, the United States, begins to put even more force and pressure on Russia in the Arctic, the argument would be it's going to be forced into a corner and it's going to have to act. And this is according to Matthew Boulege, Boule, Boule, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I give up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Matthew B. Uh, at the NATO Defense College, and what he says is any move from NATO and its allies to build up military capabilities in the Arctic, whether through exercises or posturing, will undoubtedly feed Russia's besieged fortress logic. In broad terms, the Kremlin is concerned that NATO forces could challenge Russia's sense of military superiority in the region. This could endanger the understanding that the Arctic should remain as a low tension area, pushing Russia to overreact. The basic idea here. Here, it's, it's very simple. There are diplomatic channels to resolve these disputes that don't risk further, uh, further provoking Russia. Could they fail? Sure, they might fail. We could come to the table, we could make a claim, and the claim could be rejected, or it could be accepted, and Russia could refuse to accept it. But until we have exhausted those basic channels, clearly established channels in international law, it's pointless for us to go and needlessly provoke Russia, especially when you know there's a clearly demarcated way for us to do this under international law. Try that first, and if that doesn't work, we can come back, and then we can explore the military option. So the last one we have, Tanner, is... Is the militarization links to environmental harms, which, if you remember on the pro side, there was environmental benefits due to research, but this one we're going to talk about the harms that militarization has. So the first point under this is going to be military expansion itself causes climate harms. So according to Sam Carliner, uh, they're from Responsible Statecraft, they state uh, basically all, there's a very big quote, we'll throw it on the screen, but basically it says that the de Department of Defense is the world's largest institutional user of petroleum and correspondingly the single largest institutional producer of greenhouse gases. So basically what we're getting from this quote is if we increase military presence, then we'll increase uh, emissions and we will exacerbate the process of climate change which is something that we don't want to do. We don't want to increase the amount of climate change going on, so we shouldn't very, have this Very straightforward, very sim <laughs> simple link chain kind of thing. Not, probably not a huge impact, but again, another, a, a discrete, simple, easily defensible point that they have to defend against, right? Right. right. And, and so not only is it emissions, but also, I mean, you know, there are a ton of environmental disasters associated with extracting oil itself. And, and under this point of militarization facilitates fossil fuel extraction and spills, one of the key assumptions uh, of the pro is that military expansion is needed to secure extraction of oil by stabilizing the region and preventing harassment by foreign actors. 
Facilitating oil extraction is one of the main jobs the U.S. military does. Pro is going to assume that's a benefit, but the con needs to go ahead and turn the impact and show that increased oil production is a net negative for humanity. First, in the status quo, oil production in the Arctic is somewhat constrained. According to Stephen Mufson from the Washington Post in 2022, he says that five major U.S. banks, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo, and a growing list of insurance companies have stopped giving financing uh, for the Arctic oil business. We, they say that we are glad that these companies may finally have seen the light, concluding that investing in Arctic oil is a bad deal on a planet that urgently needs to shift away from fossil fuels. And even if they aren't doing this truly conscientiously, Doesn't matter. they understand mm -hmm. that it's not a, a profitable business right. because it's going to lead to environmental harms uh, and, and, and disasters like that, which leak oil. Another point on this is that military presence relieves insecurity and helps the oil flow. This is the key point. Like what he just read was in the status quo, it's being reduced in the Arctic. Right. Now we're going to turn that around, right? Right. So, so the Rand Corp uh, writes in 2012 that the U.S. military can continue to have an important role in promoting stability in major oil producing regions and by helping protect the flow of energy through major transit corridors and on the high seas. So it's no surprise that the presence of the U.S. military is a good predictor of where oil exploration will occur. And according to Michael James Barton from the Corpus Christi Caller Times, Say that five times fast. <laughs> uh, they say that offshore drilling has long coexisted with military training. We'll show the whole, the whole quote, but that's pretty much the gist of it. So, so far the pro agrees with all of this, but this is where we turn the impact uh, on its head and argue that all this production is bad. Yeah, we just argue that oil production is bad, right? Because it's a huge, you know, number one, because of spills and number two, because of climate change, right? So the Surf Rider Foundation has an article in 2018 that just talks about how, as you'll see here on the screen, oil spills are basically an unavoidable part of offshore oil drilling. Each year, 880,000 uh, gallons of oil are sent into the ocean from North America offshore drilling platforms alone. And you can see these statistics over the years, 500 spills from 1995 to 2000. 2010, uh, 44 large spills of over 10,000 barrels since 1969. This is just an intrinsic part of oil drilling. So we're going to be energy. I won't say that the Arctic is totally pristine, but it's a lot more pristine than any other area of the world because it has been relatively untouched. And here we come doing what we always do as humanity, right? Not that we can't find other sources of energy, not that we don't have renewable resources, but we want oil because it's cheap. So we're going to go befoul this part of the planet, right? We're going to go engage in oil drilling and inevitably see lots of spills because they are inevitable. Uh, and, and in addition to that, the problem is even worse in Arctic waters, as we see here in this article from Carl Magnus Eager with the Arctic Knowledge Hub. Oil spills uh, in ice are more complicated to address than oil spills in open waters. And as you can see here, what a lot of biologists predict is that whether it's de degradation might happen over a, a matter of years in like a normal temperature ocean from an oil spill, it could take up to 50 years in the Arctic. So there's a really strong argument that we've got this area that is relatively pristine, relatively untouched, not contributing to climate change, things like that. And there's no urgent reason why we have to have this energy. There are many other energy sources available to us. And so we should shouldn't be essentially increasing our fossil fuel consumption and increasing our drilling in these areas. And that is your basic environmental argument on it. So that's what we've got on the con. We will come back in just a second with some final thoughts. Okay, having waded through all of that uh, on this Arctic topic, we are now finally at final thoughts. We'll keep them really quick. Tanner, what do you got? Yes, so again, I brought this up in my introduction or in my, in my brief here, but I really believe that the word substantial is just so heavy. And if you're on the con, this is great for you because you have a little bit more uh, leverage, kind of like going in, be like, oh, sure, I can advocate for a mediocre amount, a little amount, but substantial, you know, kind of use that for your advantage. And if you're on the pro, this is going to be a heavy weight to pull because, you know, it's substantial. You got to spend billions of more dollars on something. But again, use that tactic of we have nuclear uh, deterrence on our hands. We have a very, uh, we have a lot of things we have to consider with trade and all these other things. So use that to your advantage. But again, on either side you're on, substantial. Make that known. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, what I would say is, you know, we've just given you a whole video full of God knows what. Yeah. And <laughs> you're going to have to stitch all that together. And I do, you know, God bless you, really. Yeah. Um, but I, so I'm not going to add a whole lot onto that. We, we've just given you that, that whole video. But what I will say is just, What's going to decide the winners from the losers in this case? Because there is just so much to wade through. 
is going to be reading. You, mm -hmm. you need to read, you need to read everything that's pertinent, everything that's impertinent, and, and you need to know literally everything that could possibly coming in around. You know, I mean, read a block file at the very least, but you just need to know what you're going to be running into, even if you think it's not going to come up and around, because it will, because for whatever reason, the Arctic is just the most important region in the entire world for everything. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I have to say is I am sure glad in like 30 seconds when this video is over, I'm never going to have to think about this topic again. I don't have to go out and debate it. You do. And I'm, I'm sorry. That's just how it works. So we all get drafted to the Arctic. Right, yeah. yes. And someday, yeah, we'll have to think about it at some point in the future. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's you and not me. But I'm sure you'll do a fan. I, and all kidding aside, I'm sure you'll do a fantastic job. The thing I'll say to dovetail with Devin is once you've done the reading, you need to do the work to consolidate it down into a story, right? You need to be able to tell the judges what's going on and explain a narrative of why militarization is absolutely necessary. Maybe we're a less bad dominant power than Russia, whatever it is. And on the other side, you need to tell the story of why it's wasteful, why it's unnecessary, why it's counterproductive, and be able to tell the narrative and then have a huge amount of data in your head behind that. And that's the only way you're going to win. I wish it were a little bit more of a manageable topic, but at the end of the day, y'all are going to do great. You always do. Uh, I really do enjoy judging these things to see what you do and how creative you are with it. So at any rate, with that, we will close with what we always say, which is debate is for everybody. So remember, work hard, have fun, and hail safe.